All right, so thank you all again for joining us. Um, my name is Brittany Rogers. I am one of the co-hosts for this webinar with my colleague, Megan. Megan, if you'd like to introduce yourself in a moment. I am the Aquatic Restoration and Resiliency Coordinator for the Sleewell Prism at the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. It's a mouthful, but we'll talk about it more in a moment. My primary focus is on aquatic ecosystems and invasive species that might be impacting those areas. And so as we were gathering our plans for um, a new initiative with the Spotted Lanternfly program, we saw an opportunity with a new pathway to our region. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, but I wanna give Megan a chance to introduce herself as well. Hey everybody, my name is Megan Pistoles. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Slila Prism. Welcome. Thanks, Megan. So our agenda for today is first to go over who the Slilo Prism is, what we do, where our focuses are, and then we'll talk a little bit about the spotted lantern fly, what that is, and then really get into this new program that we're developing and some of the strategies and techniques that we're using to hopefully reach a broader audience to help prevent the spread of the um, invasive species. Megan, I do want to let you know that I have your line muted for right now, just to try to avoid any background noise. And everybody else that's on the line that has audio connected, you're also muted. And once we get to the end of the presentation, we can unmute if you have any questions you'd like to ask out loud. So first, I do want to talk about the PRISM. In 2005, the New York State Invasive Species Task Force created a comprehensive report on the status of invasive species in New York and provided 12, 12 recommendations to the governor and state legislature. From there, one of those um, recommendations was actually for the development of the PRISM, which actually started initiating in 2007. And by 2013, we had eight PRISMs that were um, hosted around New York State. So one of the prisms that I'd like to highlight specifically is the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And just to put that on the screen to kind of bring it all into play, our mission is to protect native biodiversity and freshwater resources through a collaborative approach of invasive species management. We are hosted by the Nature Conservancy and we have funding from the New York State Environmental Protection Fund, which is also in coordination between the Department of Environmental Conservation and other host organizations as well. We do collaborate with many partners on our work and we have some core programming focuses and other special initiatives that we're involved in. Um, I just wanna highlight some of those briefly just to kind of bring everybody onto the same page. So I apologize for those of you that are on the line that have heard this before, but hopefully this review is good for you as well. We primarily do our programming in prevention, early detection, rapid response, management and control, and then education and outreach, all surrounding invasive species related information. We have multiple special initiatives that we also participate in, and this includes a new urban forest sustainability initiative, the Tug Hill Forest Restoration Project, Pollinator Pathway Project, Aquatic Restoration Initiative, Environmental DNA Sampling. We have a robust watercraft inspection steward program with stewards all across the region. We've been conducting an aquatic invasive species macrophyte nutrient analysis, looking at the impact of water chestnut and then also the removal efforts of removing water chestnut. And then, of course, the whole reason why you're all on this line today is for the Spotted Lanternfly Spotters Program, which is a new initiative in our region. Just to bring everyone to play on our priority conservation areas, or PCAs, we work in multiple places across our region, but we can't actually cover all of the ground everywhere. So we work with our partners and stakeholders to determine the highest priority areas that need to be um, protected and have our work on them. And so we're currently working on almost 30 different sites or areas. And with that, we then also focus on species of concern. And in the past, we had target species 
prevention watch list species and our general invasive species list for what we were focused on. And our partners would vote on these species to be included on the list. Recently, we have been working with the New York Natural Heritage Program and IMAP invasive staff to participate in the species tier list assessment. Um, so this is helping us create a more standardized species prioritization throughout New York State. And then especially in our region, we've broken it down to tiers, what we call. Um, so we have tier one, which is early detection prevention. Tier two is eradication species. Um, three is suppression, four local control, and then tier five is monitoring for species that we might not know enough information about to put them into one of those categories. And these tier lists actually fall pretty closely aligned in line with the invasion curve. So hopefully some of you online have seen this or are very, very familiar with it. Um, so we have prevention is the most cost effective method of managing invasive species with eradication following pretty close by um, if, you know, say something does get introduced because we aren't able to fully prevent it. And although that is our main goal is to prevent that, um, unfortunately, sometimes things happen and species can go unnoticed. Um, but the longer they go unnoticed, the more likely they are to be difficult to manage or control. And so for the volunteers on the line, um, they are often participating in this early detection rapid response aspect of our work. So if something is not prevented and it is introduced, we have volunteers out there looking for and detecting these species as early as possible so that we can then respond to those new infestations and potentially manage them in a more effective manner. And so with that, I just want to kind of tie into our program here is that we are at the bottom of this curve. This species is absent in our region and we're working really hard to prevent its spread to our area. Um, I'm going to apologize that I do have animals that you might hear in the background throughout the rest of the presentation, but I appreciate your patience while they play and enjoy themselves. And so Megan, if you are unmuted, I will bring the next slide to you. Yeah, so spotted lanternfly, like Formio delicata, or SLF for short, is an invasive plant hopper native to Asia. The appearance of SLF changes depending on its life cycle stage. From instar 1 through 3, nymphs are black with white spots, and by the fourth instar they turn red with black spots just before turning into an adult with very colorful wings, as you can see from the photos. Spotted lanternflies are most often seen with their wings closed, and they um, form large swarms in ho on host plants, as you can see here from the photos. Spotted lanternfly adults and nymphs use piercing mouth parts to suck plant sap, making their host vulnerable to disease and attack from other insects. Spotted lanternfly, they swarm host plants, they feed by the thousands and secrete unpleasant sticky honeydew that attracts moles. They interfuse with photosynthesis, directly interfering with crop yield. The honeydew also hinders outdoor activities as it gives off a foul odor that attracts swarms of other insects that may sting. Here. Um, so urban forests and street trees, they bring immense beauty to our cities and provide many benefits for people in nature. Spotted lanternfly feed on over 70 different plant species. Among these hosts, our common urban street trees, many of us have grown to appreciate, such as cherry, oak, walnut, maple trees, and many other hardwood uh, tree species. <clears throat> Flelo has actually created an urban forest sustainability guide that highlights spotted lanternfly and other invasive forest pests that threaten our urban forests. You can find this guide on our website at fleloinvasives.org slash urban forest sustainability. And we're hosting a webinar showcasing this initiative this Thursday, June 11th from 11 to noon. <clears throat> Another host tree of spotted lanternfly is Tree of Heaven, Atlantis altisma, which is an invasive tree that is believed to play a role in the life cycle of spotted lanternfly. We're recruiting volunteers to survey for and report sightings of Tree of Heaven to enhance early detection efforts in our region. We will include a link in a follow-up email so you can join this effort if you're interested. Tree of Heaven is often found growing in urban areas in unlikely places like alleyways. 
It is sometimes confused with sumac or walnut due to its leaf arrangement. Tree of Heaven has finitely compound leaves, 10 to 40 leaflets with bumps or granular teeth at the base, and a V-shaped leaf scar. It gives off a foul odor, odor when crushed, and the tree bark resembles the skin of a cantaloupe fruit. One of the biggest economic impacts of spotted lanternfly is its impact on agricultural money crops, like grapes, apples, and hops. New York stands to lose millions of dollars in apple and grape crop revolution alone, not even including the economic losses associated with the wine and beer industries. Signs of infestation include egg masses that have a waxy mud-like appearance and are grayish color when new and turn brown as they age, as pictured on the left here. The middle photo shows black sooty mold that builds up under infested plants caused by the excrement of spotted lanternfly. When spotted lanternfly feed on trees, that may also ooze from the trunk, and that's another indicator of its presence. Spotted lanternfly was likely introduced to the U.S. as aid masses on a stone shipment from China, India, Vietnam, or South Korea. This map shows the current reported distribution of spotted lanternfly in the U.S. updated this March from the Integrated Pest Management website. I've zoomed in on the map to focus more on New York State and the quarantine zones near us. Uh, spotted lanternfly was first detected in 2014 in uh, Berks County, Pennsylvania. It has since spread to Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, Virginia, and West Virginia. Currently, there are no <laughs> known stations present in New York State. However, there have been sightings of individual adults and egg masses. In 2019, dead adult and egg masses were found in Oswego County, which is within the Salilo boundaries. Anyone traveling from regions with known infestations could easily introduce new populations to our region. There is such a high spread potential for this insect because spotted lanternfly lay their eggs on nearly everything, like tires and wheel wells. And they also like to hitchhike on vehicles, which you can see if you look closely um, on the photo on the bottom left here, you can actually see a spotted lanternfly hiding right behind the grill of a truck. To help prevent the spread of spotted lanternfly, we have developed an outreach strategy named Spotted Lanternfly Spotters or SLF Spotters. Our strategy involves three main steps. Provide outreach materials to target businesses such as marinas, tackle, bait shops, and charter boat services whose customers are likely to travel to our region for flying quarantine areas. We also want to gain a commitment from those businesses to distribute the materials to their customers and measure that commitment. And we want to help um, learn more about the effectiveness of our strategy and track the distribution of these materials and gain a commitment from the recipients of the materials to check their equipment before traveling and to report signs of an infestation if they're found. So to do this, we realized that we needed to have a better understanding of the businesses that were potentially part of this pathway across our region. And so we worked with a volunteer, Eileen, for a lot of hours um, trying to just scour the internet, basically, both social media and Google and different websites and things to try to figure out all of the marinas, the charter boats and captains, the fishing and tackle stores, outdoor sports stores. And in total, in our region, in the five counties alone, we have over 150 different businesses in this category. So we realized that now that we know how many target businesses we have, we have this database of information where all these businesses are located, um, some extra information about the businesses on 
on this database as well, basically this huge spreadsheet with all this information. And so now what we're doing with this is we're turning around and we are contacting all of the business owners in the region. And we're hoping for about a 30% participation rate from the businesses. So that'll give us about 50, uh, 50 or more businesses that want to participate in this program. And so what we're doing is we're calling them over the phone, asking if they know about Spotted Lantern Fly, if they're willing to participate in the program, and if they know what percentage of their customers are from out of state. And this is helping us to also better gauge the businesses that have more tourists traveling in and out potentially through those quarantine zones that Megan mentioned. And this is helping us to really prioritize this strategy and figure out the best ways to actually work with these different businesses across the region. And if they're willing to participate, we're giving them different materials. So once we get a hold of them um, and they want to participate, we'll be sending them a letter with more information about Spotted Lantern Fly, including many outreach materials and other um, just fun items that they might be able to give out to their customers or that they can set out on tables or on bulletins for people to see and read. So then what happens from here is that the businesses, we're asking them to then scan a QR code again to really go back to that strategy Megan mentioned to then be able to connect them back. Um, say they have some comments on the information they've got or if they have questions or if they need more materials because people pick them up, they can scan this and then request more information or ask whatever they need to ask. This will really help us better gauge and engage these businesses by allowing them to more freely keep connected to the program. And everything is aligned with our website and <clears throat> is funded through the New York State Environmental Protection Fund in partnership with the Department of Environmental Conservation. And Megan, I've got you unmuted. Excellent. <clears throat> this is an overview of the outreach materials that we want to distribute. I'll provide information on how to identify a spotted lanternfly and signs of infestation and where to report sightings to. There's also a QR code that will be placed in the brochures that viewers can scan with a smartphone to be prompted to a survey and that will help us track our outreach efforts. So to talk about the tracking a little bit more, we've designed a website, of course, because everything is connected to technology these days. So we designed a website to provide pretty much the same information, but then give people an easy access location for the different forms and ways that we've connected everything. So I'm going to first talk about for businesses so if they scan that QR code after they get materials and they're participating um, again they can fill out extra information they can ask us questions or request additional materials or even if they have additional suggestions um, one of the nice things that we are working on is a business media toolkit which Megan will mention in a few moments which will be convenient for them to access as well and then finally, the outreach materials that will all have that QR code on it, connecting it again to our website, is just asking people where they're traveling from, um, where they're, what businesses they've been visiting, and um, where they got the materials from. But I'll let Megan continue on this one. Those who scan the code on the materials, they're, they're prompted to this survey and ask key questions that will allow us to get a clearer understanding of the effectiveness of our outreach strategy. Importantly, we will learn where people obtain the outreach materials, where they are traveling from, which help us to better determine the spread potential of the insect, and it'll gauge the commitment of the recipient to actually take steps to prevent the spread of spotted lanternfly. For businesses who have a website, we can create custom infographics that could be displayed on your webpage to further enhance outreach efforts that show that your business is taking steps to protect our state's resources from this invasive pest. And this is just one of the examples here of um, one of the infographics that we can make for you to display on your website. 
We're asking those attending this webinar to help us with this effort. There are various ways you can get involved. You can contribute to the amenities database that Brittany mentioned earlier. This is helping us expand our reach for the program. We also need help delivering outreach materials to the businesses. And if you are a business owner, you can help by simply handing out these materials to your customers. You can easily join this effort online. So for businesses that are interested in participating, there is one third survey or sign up form that I didn't mention from the main page. And this is asking the same questions that we would have asked them over the phone. Um, just usually talking to somebody over the phone is a little bit more personal and we can better gauge what businesses are interested in receiving from us. But we can ask them the same questions, get some information about who to contact, how to do so, and if they're interested in, again, the website or displaying decals or things like that at their business. So if anyone on the line wants to share this website link with anyone else, you can do so. Um, we'll provide a follow-up email to the webinar as well. And so with that, we'll be um, kind of wrapping things up a little bit, but I just want to talk about, you know, the final kind of drive home for why this program is so important. As you can see, the quarantine area in light blue on the map here that Megan was showing you earlier, um, you know, the spotted lantern fly can easily be spread by people driving through this region. We've seen multiple examples of egg masses on vehicles, on tires, on inside of grills. Um, so both adults and eggs can easily be spread. And in New York, we have these really pristine resources that people often travel to utilize. So going out on a boat for the weekend to do some charter fishing or coming up to fish amongst the other 100,000 people that are estimated to visit the Salmon River every year. Um, we have multiple resources, small inland lakes, campgrounds. There's connections into the Adirondack Park through the Huilo region. I'm just kind of thinking about all of these opportunities for the spread or potential spread of spotted lanternfly is why we really determined that this program was important to us. And if you look at the, the main highways that drive into our region or into New York, you have them coming through Western New York, so down in the um, Western part of Pennsylvania as well. And then 81 and 95 drives right up through this quarantine zone. So if anybody stops for a period of time, there is that potential to spread invasive species. So we're hopeful that we will be able to slow the spread of the spotted lantern fly through this program. And with your help and with the help of businesses across our region, we're hoping to reach a broader audience. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. And we'd love to have um, some opportunities for you guys to ask questions, whether about the spotted lantern fly, Tree of Heaven, the Volunteer Salance Network, or the Spotters Program overall. Um, so at this point, Megan, if you have anything else you'd like to ask, or if anyone has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or submit it in the chat box now.